at the beginning like normal, and it's okay. We can, we can do it that way. But we're going to talk about Saturday. Saturday is a day that we typically, during Holy Week, I don't know, ignore, forget about, don't think about. We just kind of go from Friday to Sunday. In fact, that would be scriptural. The Gospel of Mark talks about Good Friday. In fact, last week, Mark breaks it down in three-hour increments. And if you were here, you heard 6 to 9, 9 to 12, 12 to 3, 3 to 6. That's how Mark breaks it down. And then the next thing we hear is Easter morning. Mark, the Gospel of Mark talks nothing about Saturday. So maybe that's where we get it. We go right from being put into the tomb to Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, and Salome going to an empty tomb on Easter morning. And we're comfortable with that because we probably don't want to hear about Saturday. Saturday for the Jews was the Sabbath. This was their day of rest. So what they did after the body was put in the tomb is they took their Sabbath. But why do we omit Saturday? Even in the earliest Christian traditions, Saturday was omitted. But if we look at the creeds, if we look at the Apostles' Creed, Friday, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Saturday, he descended into hell. Maybe that's why we don't want to talk about Saturday. And then Sunday, the third day, he rose again from the dead. The Nicene Creed, which is the longest creed in the Methodist hymnal, skips Saturday. It, yet it's the longest creed. Friday, for our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death, and was buried. And then immediately goes to, on the third day he rose again in accordance to the scriptures. So even that group of church fathers decided to skip Saturday. Well, are we supposed to skip Saturday? If Jesus were here, would he say, yeah, I'm glad you guys ignored Saturday. It was a tough day. <laughs> I mean, what, how would he want us? Because what is Saturday? It is the descent into the harrowing of hell. That's what it is. But not the hell that we think about. Not the hell that's the eternal punishment. Not that hell. The hell that's talked about Jesus going to on Saturday actually is the Greek Hades or the Jewish Sheol. A good place, a good way to say it is the place of the dead. It wasn't a place that people went because they were being punished. They went there because they had died. It was a place where dead people went. Remember, this is before Jesus. This is before we get this, today you'll be with me in paradise. So we have to think about it in that way. We think about it, oh, well, how could that be? When I die, I'm going to heaven. They didn't have that. They had a place for the dead. And so the English word really for harrowing into hell is a robbing of the place of the dead. Jesus went to rob the place of the dead. That's what he was doing on Saturday. And, and so we have Jewish traditions that look at this. Scholarly people. It's, you know, it's funny. I was talking to Christian and Junior out front. You know, we're talking about the palm fronds. And we're talking. So we get into glasses. And, and so Chelsea's there. And I said, Chelsea, your, your glasses really look nice on you. And, and, and Junior says, what about my glasses? I said, I think you look handsome in your glasses. Then Chelsea says, well, I think I, think I should look beautiful. And I said, oh, you look beautiful in your glasses. <laughs> Christian, though, says... Well, at least you look smart in yours. <laughs> what have you been talking to? Oh. I'm not smart, but my glasses make me look smart. Okay, I get that. I, yeah, you have been talking to a lot of people in this congregation. Listen to you. So there's a couple traditions that scholars look at when we're talking about this time of Saturday. One of those is that, that God intervened before martyrdom. But, but we know that's not true because God didn't intervene for Jesus before he was martyred, did he? No, he died. So the other tradition is God rewarded them after they were martyred. So there were people prior to Jesus that were martyred 
that died, where did they go? Sheol, Hades, the place of the dead. Not punished, just dead. So they're there. And so because God didn't intervene, we look at this second tradition of being rewarded after you were martyred. Now in Mark, even though he doesn't talk about Saturday, he does talk greatly about crucifixion and vindication. If you look, Mark 8, Mark 9, Mark 10, all talk about crucifixion and vindication. So maybe he makes up for what he didn't talk about on Saturday with a lot of extra on vindication after crucifixion. In chapter 13 he says, They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. What would that mean? Vindicated from his death. So these public vindications happen after death. And it's the second model that we want to look at when it comes to Jesus and Saturday, because we know that in accordance to the scriptures, Jesus was raised from the dead. So, Jesus on Saturday, he breathes his last breath, and now it's Saturday. For the Jews, again, that's the Sabbath day. They were resting. It was their custom. They were mourning. They were grieving. They had a, pl they had a lot of time to do it because they didn't work on the Sabbath. They prayed. They ate together. But they were mourning and they were grieving the death of their master, their teacher, not yet their savior. And they think, they think, how can this be justice that a man like this would be put to death? It's, it's just not right. But Jesus is working on this day. While they are mourning and grieving, what does Jesus do? He descends into hell or Sheol or Hades or a place of the dead. That's what Jesus is doing. He has gone there. And he's raising people up that have been martyred for the faith. He's making the righteous ones righteous again. So the supremely righteous one is making the righteous righteous. He's vindicating the martyrs. And there's ways that the scholars look at this. Now we won't look at all of these because you don't want me to preach that long. But they're intensely interesting. I, you know, I... I want to come back as a scholar. No, I don't believe in reincarnation. But I just think it'd be so nice to know this stuff so deep, like these guys do that I read. I just, and girls that I read. And so they look at it this way. Look, they look at it by story, by hymn, by image, and by silence. It's how they look at this Saturday, these times of what Jesus was doing. So, so think about it by story. Think how difficult it would be to put what Jesus is doing on Saturday into the story. I mean, you could write the story of Good Friday, could you not? I mean, you've experienced friends of yours dying, people close to you dying. You've also experienced how, how happy the funeral service can be when you're celebrating a life going to heaven. You probably haven't experienced a resurrection, but in some ways, we almost experience that when we know one of our loved ones who was a person of faith, we know where they are. We, we grieve their loss personally, but we're happy they're with Jesus. So it's almost like a resurrection. They're not dead. They're still alive. Well, but, but in writing a story of Saturday is difficult. Mark doesn't do it, but Matthew tries. Now Matthew had the benefit of already reading Mark's gospel. Remember, Mark was first, he was earlier. Then Matthew and Luke write a similar one after Mark, so they had sort of an outline to go by so they could improve on things, add more depth to things, look at the story a little differently. Remember, they had different, different vocations. So we look at things sometimes by our vocation. So Matthew, he says, this is Jesus dying, the earth shook, the rocks were split, the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tomb and entered the holy city and appeared to many. How many have heard a sermon on that? Preachers don't want to preach on that. It's difficult. It's hard to understand. You mean there were actually people came out of a tomb and people saw them in the streets. Well, that's what it says. 
and they entered the holy city and appeared to many. And then Matthew kind of shortens it so we can go to the cool part. And the cool part is, then the earthquake and what took place, people were terrified. And the Roman centurion says what? Truly this man was the son of God. And we like that. We, a Roman soldier was converted at the cross. I don't know about that stuff before Matthew was talking about. But I like that the Roman centurion was converted. But Matthew adds to the story. He adds a part of what's going on. He doesn't say exactly that Jesus went down there, but he does say that these people were released. That they were vindicated. The righteous were raised up by the most righteous. He tries to tell us about the harrowing into hell. He tries to tell us. This, the saints are appeared to be liberated through an earthquake. So Matthew says how this happened, there was an earthquake. It's a little easier than saying where Jesus went. There was an earthquake. And so he describes the resurrection as those who had fallen asleep. And we even say that in our society. You know, she just went to sleep. He just went to sleep. And that's scriptural. And that's how Matthew describes it. But they're not so much dead, according to Matthew. They're just asleep. And they're waiting for the awakening resurrection that's going to take place in their lives when? When Jesus dies, put into the tomb, and Saturday, his union card says work. He doesn't take off. People are mourning and grieving him. But he's busy. Let's look at it by him. Now what is a hymn? We think of a hymn as something we sing on Sunday. Hymns are songs. But they're also poems. But they're hymns and poems to praise God. And so how do we look at this as a hymn? It can just be praising and celebrating God to be a hymn. If we look at 1 Peter 3, uh, 18 and 19. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went, through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison. Peter's writing about Saturday. What did Jesus do? He went to preach into the spirits in prison. And then later, 1 Peter 4, 6, the gospel was proclaimed even to the dead, so that though they had been judged in the flesh as everyone is judged, they might live as the Spirit, as God does. Now, the first one's hard for us really to take. I mean, it's, we don't talk a lot about Jesus going to the prison of the spirits. It's not comfortable. But we're okay with them with Jesus proclaiming himself to the dead. We kind of are okay with that. So the second one we, we take, the first one's a little controversial. But the best expression of what Jesus did is actually in a, a book of the Apocrypha. It's called the Odes to Solomon. There's um, many chapters in those Odes. Chapter 42, starting at verse 10, is where we hear Jesus talking about, somebody writing about what Jesus did on Saturday. Here's his climactic celebration as written in the Odes of Solomon. Again, it's not a book in the Bible. It's a, an apocryphal book. It means it was not canonized, but worthy of being part of the apocrypha. They just couldn't get enough witnesses to corroborate what was written. That's why it's not part of the Bible. Not because it doesn't have legitimacy. That's what the apocrypha means. Doesn't mean they're not legitimate, just means they couldn't get enough corroborating witnesses. What does it say? I was not rejected, although I was considered to be so, and I did not perish, although they thought it of me. Sheol saw me and was shattered, and death ejected me, and many with me. I have been vinegar and bitterness to it, and I went down with it as far as its depth. Then the feet and the head it had released, because it was not able to endure my face. Of course not. We can't endure God's face. And I made a congregation of living among the dead. And I spoke with them by living lips in order that my word might be unprofitable. And those who had died ran towards me and they cried out 
and said, Son of God, have pity on us and deal with us according to your kindness and bring us out from the bonds of darkness. Help me leave Sheol. Help me leave Hades. Help me leave this place of the dead and open for us the door by which we may come out to you. For we perceive that our death does not touch you. May we also be saved with you because you are our Savior. They recognize it on Saturday. You are our Savior. Then I heard the voice and placed their faith in my heart and I placed my name upon their head because they are free and they are mine. And it ends with the word hallelujah. Isn't that right? Isn't it wonderful that those martyrs prior to Jesus were released because Jesus decided to go to the place of the dead while those mourned and grieved his loss. Jesus was busy. I like a busy Jesus. Do you like a busy Jesus or do you like a sitting Jesus? I like a busy Jesus. I like an active Jesus. I like a Jesus that doesn't sleep. I don't know, what you th I don't know how you think about Jesus. He's a busy guy for me. And if he's not busy, it says something about my life. There's not a moment I'm not thinking of Jesus as it goes through my day. Oh yeah, I'm thinking about a lot of things. But Jesus always seems to filter in. Why? Because he's busy. I like a busy Jesus. So we have this poetic, metaphorical, mythological section of this Odes to Solomon about Jesus dying and descending to the dead. But the Son of God cannot be held there. He can't be held to, to the place of the dead, can he? No. So he breaks the bars and the bolts and liberates those that are there. They come out. The righteous one leads the people of God out of the prison. In the, the Greek orthodoxy, it depicts the resurrection of Jesus uh, not as one of uh, an isolated individual, but as a group. Where, where Jesus is the liberator and he's liberating the holy ones that have passed before, who were sleeping in Hades, who were sleeping in Sheol. And they were awaiting his advent. There's a Coptic church in Cairo. Um, it's called uh, St. Sergius Bacchus. These were two guys in the early 4th century that were soldier martyrs. And there's 16 frescoes in that church. Never been there, but after doing this, I can't wait to go. I want to see them. I want, I want to look at them. I don't want to see them just on the internet. I want to see them. Well, in the one, it has Adam and Eve coming out of the tomb. Because they died prior to Jesus, didn't they? And so it has Adam and Eve coming out of the tomb. One of them has a bearded David. On the, Adam and Eve's on one side. The bearded David and an unbearded Solomon is on the other side. Again, coming out with, with Jesus. So they depict this Saturday as not Jesus alone, but Jesus with, with those people that went before him. Great men and women of faith. Eve was a great person of faith. Know that. She was. And she should be held up as so. And then there's another one in Istanbul. Oh, oh, while I'm traveling, I might as well go there, right? There's another church, a Cora church in Istanbul. You know, it's funny. I was getting my license this week. And the lady was from Turkey. And I told her I was doing a sermon. And had, she said she had been there. How crazy is that? How crazy. The lady was from Turkey. And not only that, I got my license. Was it a Thursday? Got my license on Thursday. She was going to Turkey on Friday. I said, take me with you. <laughs> it's just... There's a book called God Winks. I bought it this week. It's about these coincidences that aren't coincidence. Yeah. God incidences. Well, anyway, in that church, there's the, the image of the herring of, of hell. And it has Adam and Eve represent righteous ones. And then it also has the first martyrs. It has Abel who was martyred, right? Cain killed Abel. First martyr of the Old Testament. And then it has, on the other side, the first martyr of the New Testament, John the Baptist. It has Jesus releasing it. Think about it. Have you thought about that? That Jesus went on Saturday to release Cain, uh, Abel 
and John the Baptist. Is that cool or is it just me? Maybe it's just me. I don't know. I think that's really cool to think about that. I never really thought about that. And then it has Satan prostrate, bound at Jesus' feet. That ought to get an amen. If it doesn't, well, we need to preach longer. I got 10 more minutes. So Jesus is portraying this. God is the God of the living, not of the dead. That is the God that we are worshiping, that we've walked with, that we're going to see on Friday die, but we're going to celebrate next Sunday his raising, his resurrection, his vindication, and our redemption. Whew. I'm telling you, I don't know about you, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. That's even good in a Methodist church. <laughs> the harrowing of hell is an intensely Jewish Christian tradition. We tend to ignore it, but it's real to us. And it's also mythological. But it has these motifs to it. It has deception. Where demons are, were allowed to crucify Jesus not knowing, who, not knowing who he was. That's a thought. How about descent? The actual reason for his death and burial. And the despoiling, where Jesus, as the Son of God, broke open the prison of hell, Hades, Sheol, and released himself and the righteous ones who preceded him there. But it doesn't fit easily into, into the narrative story of Holy Week. Corporate resurrection, that, that event of a lot of people being resurrected together just doesn't fit well. We like to know that Jesus came back. Jesus died for our sin and Jesus was resurrected. But the fact is, many were raised during that time. And were these people baptized after they were raised? Was Adam and Eve baptized? Was Abel baptized? Can we go to heaven without being baptized? Clearly those martyrs that were raised out of the prison of death where they were sleeping went to heaven. So leave a question mark. So we have these reasons through hymns, poetry, art, image, and we have the gospels that say the kingdom has, of God has already begun. The kingdom of God has begun. The Son of Man has arrived. The body of resurrection has already started. Mark 1, right at the first chapter of Mark, the 15th verse says, the time has come, the time has been fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Has come near means already present. The kingdom of God is present. This is in the first chapter of Mark, the first gospel. For Mark, the kingdom of God is already here because the Son of Man is present. Finally, Mark presents Jesus and associates the one already present, kingdom of God, Son of Man, with the general resurrection. It's almost like God is spring cleaning. He's cleaning up this place where people are sleeping. He's cleaning up the prison. It's an Easter cleanup. Maybe we call it God spring cleaning. But we have this process between divinity, God, and man. This joint operation that takes place between God and ourselves that allows us to understand not that, not that we wait for God. This is important. Not that we wait for God, but that God waits for us. God is for us. This is why at the one end of Mark to the other, Jesus does not travel alone. Jesus is always with companions who represent who? All of us. All of our personalities are wrapped up in those 12 guys. We can see ourselves in one or more of them. So surely, on this Saturday of Holy Week, Jesus is working. He's busy. He's liberating. He's rescuing. He's conquering death. And those who are dead are brought back to eternal life. What were you doing on Saturday? Let us pray. Almighty and loving God, we thank you for Holy Saturday. We thank you for what Jesus was doing, for his busyness, for working, for not just staying dead and taking a rest in the tomb, 
but for getting out and going into the places where the martyrs had gone before him. And he liberates them. And they now reside with you. And that we one day, because of what you do on Sunday, we get to spend time with you when our earthly chapter closes. And we're so happy, Lord, that we don't die. We just go to a new place to live. And so, Lord, we ask that you would bless this holy week for each person here, that in their own way they would come to know you in a new and exciting way. And as they walk this week through Monday, Thursday, through hopefully participation in the Seder meal, to Friday, Good, Good Friday, where we remember Jesus' death, to a Saturday knowing that he was busy, and to a Sunday where we can celebrate his resurrection the ways we want to, through a sunrise, through a normal service, or in our hearts knowing that Jesus lives, and because he lives, I get to live also. Amen? Amen. And amen. Our final hymn is number 593, Here I Am, Lord. <laughs>